Hello, welcome to all our viewers and readers from across the world. You're watching um, the TR Business March April easy, uh, coinciding with the IAA DFS Summit of the Americas. Uh, of course, some copies will be available uh, during the show. I am joined by Michael Payne, the president and CEO of IAA DFS. Michael, pleasure to be speaking to you once again after so long. Luke, it's nice to see you. Thank you. I hope you're well. Doing well, Michael. So I want to just begin by asking you uh, to really characterize the mood amongst your membership and what you are seeing and the conversations that you've had internally. What's your current take on the health of US airport retail, particularly given those international border restrictions uh, were lifted in November in, in, in a big, big development for the industry? Yeah, well, well certainly we'll, we're not back to the pre-19 levels, but I think it's fair to say that people are feeling really very positive about what's going on with the lifting of some of the travel restrictions, both east-west and north-south. Uh, the airport, I've been traveling uh, quite a bit the last few weeks, airports are very busy, the flights are full. Um, and, and so I think people are feeling very positive about what's coming and, and see the decline in um, COVID as, as being a real sort of North Star for them coming into the spring and the summer. So I think uh, be cautious, you know, they, they understand they're gonna be different demographics and different issues, but I think people are very uh, upbeat, positive and gonna be smart about how they come back. COVID rates, of course, are declining across the US. That's certainly what we're seeing at the moment, although transmissibility is still uh, a major issue. Are we beginning to see the light now for airport duty-free with that restoration of traffic? I think we're certainly gonna see the light in the spring and summer and going towards the fall. I guess the real question is, is there any kind of resurgence next fall? But I think people will be prepared to deal with it very differently than we were this time. Um, but, but I certainly think people are feeling very positive about the uh, lifting of the restrictions and, and you know, depending on what state or country or community you're in, the restrictions involving masking and social distancing, all of that is changing and all of it's moving into a more open acceptance. And I think that's going to have a huge impact on, on travel and, and meetings and events. So um, I, I think most people are seeing that, frankly. I want to ask you now, Michael, about some of the more pressing advocacy issues that IAA DFS are, are focusing on at, at this time. Can you give us a, a bit of a briefing uh, on that fiscal or otherwise in terms of the support you're, you're drawing for, for airport retailers and suppliers? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to have a minute to chat about that. So, of course, last year I was focused on trying to get airport relief as, as you're well aware and so we spent a considerable amount of time and resources not just us but working with other coalition partners to try to get relief for concessionaires retailers and the airports and we were successful in doing that and those programs are now being administered by uh, the airports and the FAA and our and our folks are benefiting from those um, as well we're also continuing to work and coordinate with other organizations on uh, labeling issues and um, it, any possible restrictions on the sale of duty-free products that might come from some international structure. We are um, I, I'm, we're looking at the arrival shopping question. We're looking at get, gate delivery, both of which are very complicated in, 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 in the States. Um, and so we're and we're working closely with uh, the spirits community on, on some of the labeling issues that not not just for spirits, but for confectionery and other products as well. So those are some of the primary focus at the moment. Let's talk a little bit about some of the funding or support that you received last year. The U.S. pledged eight billion to, to airports. And of that, we know that there was approximately a billion uh, in support two concessionaires administered by the FAA uh, across two tranches of funding. It was less than the five billion that the IAA DFS lobbied for. What sort of impact has the funding that the industry received had in real terms? And are you pushing for a further package of stimulus at this time? 
we aren't actively engaged in pushing for a further stimulus package. And I think that the, in fairness, the answer to your question about how has it really impacted them is still an evolving picture. You know, the, there's, there's more than one sort of program out there to help airport concessionaires. The billion that you referenced, those grants have to be uh, submitted by the airports to the FAA and approved by FAA. And then our folks have to work with the airports directly. So there's a lot of activity going on right now. Some of those monies went to rent relief um, and minimum annual guarantee relief. And, and that happened earlier. Um, some of those dollars are not even eligible for that if you'd already gotten loans um, from the CARES Act. So there's a, there are a lot of moving parts and the uh, airports themselves have received several um, big packages um, during the COVID crisis. So th those monies feel like they get intermingled sometimes because you could, you could be combining some grant um, activity. But, but I know that uh, the concessionaires across the board, they obviously just weren't for duty free concessionaires or other retail operators and restaurants and small businesses that were benefiting from those as well. Um, and, and so I really don't think it, it, there's a way to measure the impact quite yet, but certainly we'll be able to do that in, uh, in, in the near future because these grants are in many cases just starting to be administered. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. I want to turn now to your preparations for, for the summit. Obviously, we're seeing the return of the event in physical form in, uh, in a significant development, given the virtual platform that uh, was hosted last year. How are things progressing at this point? Um, and tell us, if you can, a little bit about the decision to go it alone this year, not partnering with, with Assetil. Sure. The, the, you know, the situation with, 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 the, with the summit is, I think, uh, I'm feeling really constructively positive about it. We've got uh, a different kind of event plan, as, as, as you will know. We, at this point of our conversation, we don't have any more exhibit space. Um, all the content programs, because we're going to have six different content sessions, are, are well developed and we'll be finalizing those uh, probably this week. Um, and, and the registration has really started to pick up the last uh, week and a half. I, I think I've shared with you in earlier conversations. We got started very late in this process. We didn't make the decision in late September. And so we, we didn't really get underway with registration until after November or mid-November and then the holidays. So it's been a slower uh, registration process, but you can clearly see the numbers uh, picking up in the last week or two. And, and we expected that. We knew it was going to be last minute. Uh, your question about Acetil, well, Acetil is certainly still partnering with us. They are a content partner, so they're engaged with us in the event. I think your question is more the formal arrangement that two of us had for the last three years, and it was a three-year um, initiative. And honestly, I don't know that you can really measure it after those three years because we didn't have events in two of them. And what, well, we had one virtual, one in person, and then not, and didn't have one. And I think the, the, the decision was more an economic one in terms of um, taking on the liability of space and hotels and contracts that I think there was just a sense that it was probably better for us just to do that and not try to have a joint venture, but obviously still stay, stay connected with each other, which, which we're doing. Um, so there isn't a formal cost sharing agreement this year, but there's still a, a lot of partnering going on and a lot of engagement between the two organizations. Do you see IAA DFS partnering next year with Acetil on the basis that we have another event? I think that's an open question and I think it's something that's gonna get discussed between both parties after, after April, after we see how this goes. And then Acetil of course has um, uh, puts on their own events and, and I, I think they're planning to do that this year on, on, on border issues as an example. So I, I think those are conversations we're going to have. I think everybody feels like we've got to take a breath and see how this goes uh, in April and what we do the following year. Our intent is to be back in Palm Beach the following year with a bigger exhibit uh, floor plan. But, you know, we just got to wait and see how this evolves. And just finally, Michael, on the dynamics of the program this year, obviously it'll be a busy conference agenda. We know that with a, a real strong emphasis on the educational element. But what can visitors expect from the broader programs, specifically the networking opportunities, 
in and around the exhibit hall and the conference areas and also any social activities that you've got planned? Yeah, we're, well, we're trying to uh, accomplish everything at once. So we're, we've got an active social program, which is uh, each night we're going to have a, a reception um, uh, starting, I think, 630 uh, until eight, uh, two of them will be at the convention center, if you will, and one will be over at the Sunday night reception will be over at the um, Hilton, which is connected to the property. So we've got those social settings um, established, those opportunities. We've got exhibits and private room opportunities for uh, suppliers and buyers to meet. We've got the content sessions, which we just talked about a little bit um, on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we don't have any plan for Wednesday. Um, and then we're going to have an area that's going to be, uh, I think we're just going to call it the Summit Lounge, where we're going to have an opportunity for people to sit down if they want to visit with somebody. There'll be coffee and some food service in there. We're trying to design an area where, you know, you'll have a place to go if you see someone you want to meet with, so you can have a place to go sit down and, and talk. So we hope between those opportunities that everybody will get what they need out of the show seems like flexibility is very much the uh, the order of the day and um, yeah we're looking forward to our business certainly uh, in playing a, an important part and, and make a contribution to the education program and we're excited about that um, so we thank you also for the opportunity on that michael and no, thank wish, you i'm looking forward to your session That's yeah good. and wishing you and your colleagues all the uh, all the best in your preparations as the date draws closer michael payne thank you very much for speaking to us Thank you, Luke. Thanks for taking the time. Have a good day. Bye now.